ಓಸುದೇವಸುತ ಕಂಸಚಾಣುರಮರ್ದನ ದೇವಕಿ ಪರಮಂದ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ವಂದೇ ಜಗದ್ಗುರು was reading swami brahmananda said about sri ramakrishna he has come to he has come as a bridge to make a bridge between jiva and shiva between the sentient beings like us and god shiva so bhagavad gita we were studying the 12th chapter and the 15th verse very nice verse but we had a little gap in between because i was off on a short trip to india we missed a couple of classes 15 verse let's read it again yasmano dvijate loko yasmano dvijate loko lokano dvijate chaya lokano dvijate chaya ಹರ್ಷಾಮರ್ಷ ಭಯೋದ್ವೇಗೈರ್ ಹರ್ಷಾಮರ್ಷ ಭಯೋದ್ವೇಗೈರ್ ಮುಕ್ತೋ ಯ ಸ ಮೇ ಪ್ರಿಯ ಮುಕ್ತೋ ಯ ಸ ಮೇ ಪ್ರಿಯ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಹೂಮ್ ದ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಗೆಟ್ಸ್ ನೋ ಟ್ರಬಲ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಹೂ ಗೆಟ್ಸ್ ನೋ ಟ್ರಬಲ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದ ವರ್ಲ್ಡ್ ಹೂ ಇಸ್ ಫ್ರೀ ಫ್ರಮ್ ಇಲೇಷನ್ ಜೆಲಸಿ fear and anxiety he is dear to me hmm. what it means is uh, who gets no trouble from the world is nobody like that we all get trouble from the world who is untroubled by the world so this attitude of um, not causing trouble for others not causing the vega or udvega the, the sanskrit word it means um anxiety there's a new word nowadays especially here in america panic attack <laughs> so who is not the cause of panic attacks for others who does not cause trouble for others now one may say that i do not deliberately cause trouble for others that's good one should not deliberately cause trouble for others and then take an extra effort to to make sure that even inadvertently even inadvertently we are not the cause of trouble for others our behavior our speech um it should not be a, a source of trouble for others so the world is not troubled by me even then one might be a you know, person might be troubled by you can't do anything by your very existence <laughs> so but uh, as far as possible deliberately i shall not do anything to harm others to cause anxiety or fear in others and uh, even if uh, even inadvertently also i'll put forth as much effort as possible a spiritual seeker should be gentle i've seen this remarkable combination of gentleness and firmness in uh, many many spiritual masters uh, senior monks and others i've seen they're very gentle but also very firm unshakable there is a sto- there is a saying a chinese saying which says that uh, um s- stand like a rock flow like water so in matters of opinion in matters of the world you flow like water and in matters of principle stand like a rock principle means means your core values say you are a spiritual seeker stand like a rock there let nobody shake you there our problem is we do the opposite in matters of opinion on twitter we f- fight endlessly uh, and in matters of principle we let it go at the first <laughs> so now one yasman no dvijate loka from whom the world gets no trouble why should the world get any trouble from us the first the sign of a sadhu the vow of monastic monastic vows shivaratri by the way this is the night on which uh, in india those who want to become monks they take the vows of monasticism on this night traditionally uh in the himalayas and other places they take the uh, vow of monasticism on this night and uh, in our order we have modified it a little bit 
three nights hence on the night of the birthday of Sri Ramakrishna, which is three days hence, uh, that night in our order in Belur Mat, uh, vows of monasticism are given. Among the primary vows, one of them is Abhayam Sarva Bhutebhya. I I grant the boon of fearlessness. I grant fearlessness to all beings. From me, there shall be no harm to anybody. So this is not just for monks. It's uh, from us, you know. So the the you give fearlessness to others. Why should uh, a devotee, a, a person who loves God, be a source of trouble for others? Um, the devotee, the bhakta, is busy with God, is constantly engaged with God, with not with the world. Internally, con constantly engaged with God. So it should not be a source of trouble for uh, anybody. Even in words, the Holy Mother would teach, Masharada, she would teach disciples, even, you know, to speak gently, so, so that our, even our speech does not hurt somebody. Mark Twain, I like that saying, Mark Twain is inimitable of course, uh, he says, uh, I have often seen that those who claim to be fond of the brutal truth are usually more far, uh, fond of brutality than the truth. <laughs> yeah. I tell the truth, I'm straightforward, I just tell the truth too. But uh, there's something else going on psychologically inside, there, you know. And often these persons are quite intolerant about anybody who tries to tell any truths to them. <laughs> You'll find such people who are very critical of others, uh, very, uh, you know, always finding faults with others, but they're completely intolerant if you find out one or two, uh, if you say anything, they're mildly critical about them also. No. It should be the other way around. should welcome criticism. There's an old saying, and in East and West, the same saying is there, they keep your critics near you because they keep you clean with, without soap and water. <laughs> In Hindi, the saying is there, but also in, I have heard the saying is also there in, I think in, it's an ancient Greek or Roman proverb or something. So, so it's there in, everywhere. So your critics, they may not be right what they, what they are saying about you, but if there is anything useful there, take it and let the rest go. What's your problem? There is a saying, in the, even in the Patanjali Yoga Sutras, that... Uh, in the presence of a true sage, even animals lose their natural enmity. So those animals who are predators, who eat others, and the animals which are prey, they're naturally scared of the predators, but in the presence of a sage. So, you know, the lion and the lamb uh, live together. So it's quite possible. The vibrations of peace which come from such a person, Swami Brahmananda himself, to give one example, in our uh, ashram in Banaras, there's a hospital. There are two ashrams, which are same ashram basically, but there are two sides to it. One side is what is called the Kashi Advaita Ashram, where monks live and practice meditation and study. The other one is the Seva Ashram, which is a hospital, where monks serve sick people. Now once, at the very inception of this uh, institution, there was a big quarrel between the two sets of monks. And the quarrel was on, you know, what's important? Is all this work, this hospital, is this central? Or is study and meditation central? And there was a lot of quarrel and a lot of indiscipline. All of these things happened. And there was Swami Saradanandaji, who was the general secretary of the order. Swami Turiyananda, another direct disciple of Sri Ramakrishna. They couldn't settle the problem. Finally, they sent word to Swami Brahmananda, who was the president of the order. He wrote back saying, I am coming, don't do anything before I come. So naturally, there was talk, the president of the order is coming, or maybe he's going to call meetings, maybe there will be people will be punished. So Swami Brahmananda came and there was a lot of discussion going on among the monks. What's going to happen now? Well, nothing. He didn't call any meetings, did not say anything to anybody. He just said, every day in the morning, come and meditate in my room. Early in the morning before sunrise, all of you come and sit in my room, all the monks, to sit and meditate with me. A few days went away like this, went by, and slowly a change came in the mindsets of these monks, especially the ones who had been quarreling. 
so much so you know they started feeling is this what we have given up home for which, which we have given up our worldly lives for uh, to fight with each other no we have given all this up for attaining god so much so the ringleader of the quarrel he uh, finally left the monastery and went away, away to the himalayas and was never seen uh, or heard of from again <laughs> so this is how see without doing anything at all just sitting there he calmly said, no fear from me. There is a story which I read. Okay, two stories, one from China and one from Japan. Uh, this is a Chinese martial arts master who had, uh, when he was about to die, he wanted to hand over his martial arts school to his sons. He had three sons. So he called them and uh, said, there's a test. Who has learned the martial arts best? There's a test. The test is, there's a valley in front of the house and there's a fierce wild horse there. You have to cross the valley to the other side. So the first son went in and the horse came charging at him and the son fought him off and then came across, across the, the valley with great difficulty, came out bruised and bloodied and she said, but I did, I did it. The second son, he went into it, but very skillfully scaled some of the cliffs on the side so the horse couldn't reach him though the horse charged at him and tried to get hold of him he avoided it skillfully and without fighting he came out the third son went into the valley and walked across the horse didn't attack him uh, and of course the master said that you are the one who has learned it best another is a story i liked very much from um, medieval japan so there was this uh, it seems there was a Zen master um, famed for his wisdom. So one day a warrior, a samurai came to him and asked him this question. Teach me about heaven and hell. Teach me about heaven and hell. And the master who was sitting in his meditation posture said, I don't have time for ruffians like you. And the, mas and the samurai, the warrior was furious. He said, don't you know who I am? He drew out his sword and un unsheathed his sword. And he said, don't you know, I can um, uh, cut off, uh, I, I can run you through without blinking an eye. And uh, this Zen master said, that's hell. Immediately the warrior realized his mistake and he sheathed his sword and he bowed down and said, I am very sorry. He said, that's heaven. <laughs> what is heaven and hell? <laughs> so, so why should there be any fear uh, from a spiritual seeker? You are, if you are a spiritual seeker, uh, I should be a source, I should not be a source of any kind of anxiety or trouble to others. It should be a source of peace to others. Blessed are the peacemakers, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. Then, the other way around, you should not be troubled by the world. The world will trouble you. There are troublesome people, there are troublesome events, there are troublesome, the weather can be troublesome, um, animals and what not. The financial trouble, so many. We are surrounded by trouble. In the Bhagavad Gita itself, Sri Krishna says, you have attained to a world of suffering. Prapya imam asukham lokam. Having attained to this world of suffering, worship the Lord. Bhajaswamam, worship me the Lord. So there we are going to face, face trouble. Just because we have decided to become spiritual seekers, doesn't mean we will be spared. Not at all. Life will go on as it is. Our spirituality should be able to protect us against it. Protect us does not mean that sufferings will not come. They will come as usual. As our karma, so our sufferings will come. But we should be able to, with the, on the basis, on the strength of our spiritual practice, overcome this suffering. If you are a jnani, whom will you be afraid of? Because the Upanishad says, Dvitiyadvai bhayam bhavati. From the other, there is fear. From a second there is fear. If you are a jnani, if you are in a, on the path of Vedanta, non-duality. Non-duality means there is no other. What, what the person who appears to be an other is I myself. I am looking at myself through those eyes. 
literally true because it's the same consciousness with this mind is this guy and the same consciousness with that mind and that personality is that guy but as awareness as consciousness we are the same reality literally one so who, where is the other whom whom are you going to be afraid of upanishad says from the other there comes fear the french philosopher sartre says hell is other people <laughs> Hell is other people. <laughs> so, uh, but there is no other. There is literally you yourself. If persons in a dream, everybody you meet in a dream, people you like, people you don't like, people you are indifferent to, they are all you. They are all you. Literally they are you the dreamer. dreamer. That's true here also, according to non-duality, according to Vedanta. And if you are a bhakta, a devotee, a lover of God, then your beloved Lord, your Shiva, your Divine Mother, your Father in Heaven is present in all beings, in everybody whom you meet in the hearts of all beings, there is the same divinity. You are meeting God when you meet these people. Why should you be afraid of them? Why should you be disturbed by them? But they behave in abominable ways with me. All right. But that behavior is because of the screen of that particular mind. That's the mask they are wearing. The same person wearing different masks. Same reality wearing different masks. Knowing that my Lord is in there, I should not be um, upset. I should not be upset with anybody. I should be forgiving. I should be absorbing. One of the best definitions of strength I've heard and I've not heard it anywhere else. It's from one monk who told me the definition of strength is to carry on regardless of contradictions. There'll be contradictions in life. He was actually, to explain, he was running a school, a, a college actually, in, in, in Calcutta, in Bengal. And th at that time, that was the, the communist government. And there were people in the staff of that college which he was running who had you know, who had sued him in court because they wanted to take away the institution and they wanted to remove him. And their, a court appearance had come up and those teachers had come to him as the principal of that college for leave. They wanted leave so that they could go and appear in court against him. And he had to give leave to them. So I asked him, how do you live with this? He said, that's, uh, that's my definition of strength, the ability to live and work with contradictions. It will not make sense, uh, but if you can live and work through that, then you're a strong person. Um, a devotee. Why should a devotee be afraid of anybody? The Upanishads say that him, that, that the only one one is afraid of in the beginning of spiritual life is God. And the, the Lord by whose fear, the Upanishad says, by whose fear the worlds whirl around in their orbits, the sun shines and the moon shines and the clouds pour forth rain. Uh, that power, that Lord is in your heart. Whom should you be afraid of? Sometimes we are afraid of criticism. Once Sri Ramakrishna asked Narendranath Vivekananda, I think he knew that one day he will have to face criticism and he had to go out in the work and world and face criticism. So he asked, if people criticize what you are doing, what will you say to them? What, what will you think of them? What will be your attitude? And he quoted a, a Hindi proverb. Hati chale bazaar mein, kutta bhoke hazar mein. The elephant walks through the bazaar and the, the dogs bark in their thousands. I mean, like lots of dogs are barking at the elephant. What does the elephant get? Nothing. Sri Ramakrishna, of course, he, he laughed and he said, not so far. That means don't have an attitude of contempt for people, even if they're criticizing you. And that Vivekananda later on, he met so many times he had to face extremely unfair circumstances and criticisms. I remember one time in, he was in Lahore and uh, he was praising a certain editor of a newspaper. And somebody said, Swami, do you know that in his latest editorial he has criticized you? And Swami Vivekananda said, what are you saying? Just because somebody has said, somebody doesn't like me, should I, um, sh should I ignore his good qualities? Should I not praise his good qualities? See, you're big enough to appreciate 
the goodness of others even though temporarily for the time being they may seem to be against you but still vivekananda's definition of humility he said humility is we does not consist in being a doormat humility is seeing the greatness of the other there's a very interesting definition of humility and very much in in consonance with vivekananda's philosophy you know is it just me or is it is, is it a little warm in here if you warm you can switch there is a fan you can put that fan on for a while yeah so do not be disturbed by the world do not whether you are a gyani or a bhakta one of these attitudes i am the same consciousness in all beings or i uh, the my lord dwells in all these beings the lord whom i worship my shiva dwells in all these beings when i'm coming across people i dwell in, the, in in this way i have seen again and again uh, in our main monastery i was very impressed the, the, sometimes people would come behave badly or a young a, a particular case i remember two youngsters they barely out of their teens a little rough and they were they had come to scoff i think and to my anger but the swami who was in charge of the grounds there he behaved so well with them he behaved sweetly with them and he called them and gave them prasad and asked about their welfare they were absolutely overcome and within a few days they were st- they started coming as volunteers in the <laughs> in the, in the <laughs> monastery how just love just love just the feeling that that he is on my side he understands me people want to be seen and felt and understood you know that uh, so not just verbal expressions of love more than that something deeper than that yasman no dujate loko lokan no dujate chaya from whom the world is not disturbed and who is um, unperturbed by the world no matter what happens i have mentioned this story about ramana maharshi also earlier um, somebody wrote an article critical of him and published it in the newspaper of was going to publish in newspaper sent a copy to him and ramana maharshi took it and he corrected the grammar and the language and sent it back to him and somebody said but he is criticizing you and ramana maharshi's attitude was he said oh no 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 he is criticizing some fellow called ramana <laughs> he doesn't even think that i am this personality he is expanded beyond it uh-huh. girish ghosh said two persons escaped from maya one was narendranath vivekananda who became bigger and bigger and bigger and so the net of maya couldn't hold him another was nag mahashay one of the disciples of sri ramakrishna who was the very picture of humility he was from present day bangladesh a place called deobhog very picture of humility i mean his life is extraordinary so he made himself smaller and smaller and smaller till he slipped through the the <laughs> net of maya so th- our problem is we are medium sized so we get we get caught <laughs> caught in the we have medium sized <laughs> personalities we are neither big nor small somebody said this it's not relevant but i remember uh, somebody a, a newspaper editorial after something happened in international affairs so in, in india uh, the newspaper editorial said that unfortunately india is neither rich enough to bribe nor powerful enough to intimidate nor principled enough to <laughs> inspire <laughs> so that's our condition so vivekananda made himself bigger and bigger and bigger till he no maya couldn't catch him and nag mahashay made himself smaller and he was so humble and somebody asked him why do you keep saying that you are the lowest because whatever you criticize him he he will accept it immediately he says that it is true and uh, <laughs> it was difficult to be be with him there was um at one time 
two monks went to visit him. People, monks used to go and see him, uh, for, you know, just to see how, as a person exists of such extraordinary spiritual depth and such humility. So when he, uh, he was married, uh, he and his wife, they lived in this uh, hut in, in, in the village. Not a hut, quite a big house in the village. And when the monks came, so they gave up their best room and he slept outside in the veranda. And because one day I think there was rain or something, there wasn't enough firewood, the monks had to prevent him from chopping down the pillars of his house to set fire to it so that he could cook food for, for the monks. You know, when the, so the monks wanted to make good their escape because every day was a feast and didn't want to impose upon him. But he was just so overcome that the two monks were, who were far junior to him in age. They had just been sent from the monastery that go and see. <laughs> So they decided to make good their escape. They said, we have got some work, we have to go back to our mo the monastery. Because they found that if they stayed there, it's, uh, I mean, he is just giving up everything in his life, spending money like water just for, for them. So they went to the railway station. He, of course, accompanied to them to the railway station. And there was such a crush in the, in the, uh, in the train that the monks didn't get a seat to sit. He was standing. It is a very common thing in India. But Nag Maharshay started wailing so loudly that, uh, Oh, unfortunate me, because of me, the, uh, the uh, holy sirs have got no, <laughs> no place to sit. That so many people got up and said, Please stop crying. <laughs> Let them sit. <laughs> Bangladesh is a place of big rivers. So instead of highways and bridges, you, have, you cross rivers. And nobody wanted to, no boatman wanted to take Nag Mahashaya because he wouldn't allow them to row. He would snatch the uh, oars away from them and row himself. No, uh, you know, coolie, those who carry loads, they wouldn't come near him because he would snatch their loads away and insist on carrying it himself. <laughs> when he would come to Belur Mat or to, to Mother's house in Calcutta, he would often come to visit. He had tremendous respect for her, tremendous reverence for her. If she would give food for him to eat, they would give it in banana leaves. You know, and that's a traditional way of serving. He would eat the food and he would start eating the banana leaf. <laughs> because she has served it or, or she has sent it for him. So the instruction was when he eats, wait for him to finish and the moment he has finished, snatch the leaf away from him. <laughs> so like that, it was tremendously. So that, that making oneself so small. Of course, that's a way of disturbing the world also because everybody else is on, on walking on eggshells around you. <laughs> Saint Francis of Assisi. So, by the time he had become very popular among the brothers, one of the brothers asked him, Saint Francis, why you, why you? You know, you're neither learned enough like brother so and so. You don't come from such a noble family like brother so-and-so. Uh, you have not done great works like brother so-and-so. Why you? Why you? Why is it that you are our leader and why is it that you are the one everybody loves? And he, St. Francis went into an ecstasy. He said, I prayed on it what you, and you are right. I am the lowest among you and therefore the Lord has chosen me. It's to humble the learned and the rich and the great. That to show that nothing is done by wealth or by your learning or by your great efforts. It is by the poorest among us, the humblest among us, the least learned. Oh, he had also said, why you? You are not good looking. <laughs> why are you so popular? Among the most plain among us, the Lord does great works. It is true what you said. I am the least least among you all. And that's why the Lord is showing us. <laughs> so, Nyasman no dvijate loko, lokan no dvijate chaya. From whom uh, the world is not disturbed and who is not disturbed by the world. Vivekananda says, uh, a practice, let this be a spiritual practice. Let nothing disturb the serenity of your mind. Very hard practice. <laughs> let nothing... So it's a, something. It's something that we can practice most of the time, yeah. especially in company with others, in the midst of work. Yeah. 
Manhattan, good place to practice this. Let nothing disturb the serenity of the mind. Everybody is disturbed. Right? Harsha, Marsha, Bhayo, Dvegai, Mukto, Yasa, Chame, Priya. Harsha, elation, excitement. Good, right? He said, no, not good. Um, amarsha. The way it is translated in most of the books, it's translated as jealousy. As jealousy. But Shankar, um, Shankaracharya, one of the commentators translates it as competition. But Shankaracharya gives the basic meaning of the word. It is asahishnuta, inability to withstand others. Inability to, you know, I just can't stand you. Your success I can't stand. Or just your presence I can't stand. That, that inability to, uh, to you know, withstand others or to bear with others. Asahishnuta, intolerance of others. So intolerance of the success or the happiness of others would become jealousy, for example. Um, harsha, marsha, bhaya, fear. So these are udvega, these are the great uh, agitators. And Krishna says, the one who is free from these is dear to me. We are talking about devotion, this is the yoga of devotion. So this, that is a true devotee. So you have to be free of undue um, uh, excitement, exhilaration of, um, you know, harshita is uh, elation. I'll come to that. And this um, jealousy, uh, inability to, uh, to accept something good happening to somebody else. And uh, then uh, fear, fear. So these are like fires. And if these fires are burning in our heart, how will the Lord stay in our heart? We have to cleanse our heart and cool our heart and, you know, and then the Lord comes and stays. Then the Lord comes in. We, we, how can you invite an honored guest into your house if it is dirty, if it is on fire? <laughs> you cannot. You have to make all the best possible arrangement and then in invite the honored guest in. And here is the greatest of guests. There is a very be um, beautiful song. I think it's um, Rajani Kant or something, a Bengali song. It goes like this. If in this life, my Lord, I... I do not get to see you in this life. I do not get to see you. Let me not forget. Let it haunt me in lives to come. Let it haunt my, let it be a pain, in, let, let it be a sorrow, a suffering in my dreams. Let it haunt my dreams in lives to come. What will haunt me? That I did not see you, my Lord. That I did not get your vision, your grace. That. And very beautiful words are there. If I decorate my house, he says, if I decorate my house, house is here, is the, it stands for all my life. If I decorate my house with all kinds of, you know, expensive things in my house, you know, like paintings and vases and whatnot, gadgets and stuff. If I decorate my house with all wonderful things, let me not forget that I have failed to invite you to my house. And if out of uh, laxity, out of laziness, on this long journey, I sit down by the wayside, you know, like I take a break. <laughs> Let me not forget that all the ways are still open. I have not walked them. You know, the ways of yoga, and spiritual paths are open. I have not, those ways remain untrod. Let me not forget that. Um, so to invite the Lord into my house, I have to, into my heart. I have to cleanse my heart and calm my heart and cool down my heart. Peaceful, serene, not disturbed. One disturbance is elation. See, this is something to be understood. We think it's good. It's good to be elated. Every, especially the culture today and especially here. More so in California. <laughs> Little less so on the East Coast I discovered and much less so in Boston. I discovered that early when I came, I first was sent to uh, the Vedanta Society in, in Hollywood, which is real California. 
So I went there and you can see the difference. In the morning when I, the Sunday talk, I say, good morning and they'll all go, good morning Swami and somebody yelled, um, we love you. <laughs> and in Boston, I gave them a cheerful, good morning, namaste. They were like, mm-hmm. <laughs> They're very stolid New Englanders. <laughs> that's good actually. Uh, Krishna is saying that's good. This elation, whatever goes up has to come down. And the nature of the mind is to go up and down. The nature of life is also to go up and down. That's karma. Karma giving its results. So whatever will go up will come down. The nature of the mind is also it goes up and comes down. The thing is, you don't have to go up and down. This is a lesson to be learned. You don't go up and down with the going of the mind going up and down. Uh, I remember this spiritual master, he gave a very nice example of training the mind. He said, when you learn how to drive, your teacher is telling you, keep your eyes on the road. Keep your eyes on the road. And then shows you how the screen windscreen wiper works you know how does it work it works like this and if you go <laughs> it, no keep your eyes on the road let it do its job <laughs> you don't have to look this way this is like the mind and what we do is we follow it around huh? up and down we go up and down with the mind don't don't it, it, it's terrible I am both ways this hilarity uh, the one who gives in to extremes of elation and excitement will also suffer the crash if you retain a sense of centeredness within in times of when things go really well you see up yeah, you enjoy it it's good but it's all right it's not that great uh, Swami Atma Rupanandaji who is now in Gretz in France so he does a nice satire. He says, now everything is, you have to be excited about everything. You know, everywhere you're asked, are you excited? <laughs> no, why? Why should I be excited? You have to be excited. Uh, so he says, a serial advertisement, he'll show that. And how excited and delighted you are. And he says, no, no, no. No serial in the world can make you th that happy. I if it does, something is wrong with you. Um, and the other way around, when the crash comes, those who are, uh, go up excited and they will they come uh, crashing down in depression. The opposite is depression. There is this um, uh, writer, Eknath Ishwaran. He writes very beautifully and he has a three volume commentary uh, on the Bhagavad Gita. A very spiritual man and uh, I mean long before my time, I never met him. I've read him and he was an uh, English literature professor so he writes very beautifully the three volume commentary on the Bhagavad Gita and I'm, I'm grateful to some people recently for introducing me I knew the book existed I never really read it but some people introduced me to it again and so I was seeing his commentary on this he's given a long commentary on this he says this, this problem of uh, elation excitement and then depression he gives an example from his home state Kerala he said in Kerala, we had uh, these single storied long wooden houses and they had wooden doors and big wooden windows. And if the wood was go good quality, the windows would work for centuries. But if the wood was cheap, then they would warp in the heat. Uh -huh. And when they warp, they wouldn't close properly. So if you tried to open it, it would slam open. And it would be difficult to close it. There are people who engage with the world and completely lose themselves in the world. They are completely taken up with whatever the issue is. The anger or the quarrel of the moment, the fight of the moment. It could Nowadays it's all virtual also. Uh, they are exhausted by fighting virtual fights. All day long. I have replied, given a good strong reply to that fellow and that, this fellow uh, on, on uh, X, uh, formerly known as Twitter. And why are they exhausted now? Oh, 
after so much fighting. Completely useless. Especially for spiritual seekers, extremely damaging. He says it's completely open to the world. Open to the world in, in the sense, no control over, over the senses. Constantly distracted. And of course he, he was writing in a, uh, in a time before modern social media. Uh, I don't know what he would have said to this. A hyper distracted world. Constant impulses from social media were distracted, continuously distracted. Um, and he says when you close those windows uh, you try to slam it shut and it closes it, it will not open easily uh, if it does close at all so those warped windows and he says that exactly what happens to such people who give in to excitement and then a crash comes in its mild form you will find such people he gives another sign of such people they talk a lot they get excited and they talk and talk and talk uh, and they are busy all day long without achieving much. Uh, their effect, emotional effect is very high. Uh, whether it's joy, expression of joy or expression of misery, one moment jo joyous, next moment I'm feeling so deeply for others. What are you doing for others? Nothing particular. But I really, really feel deeply for everybody uh, and tears come to their eyes very quickly. But all temporary. Enthusiasm. I knew this person in, in Hollywood. He, he was all in for big causes, you know. The only problem was the cause he was working for changed every three days. <laughs> and this gentleman, he could talk a lot. I mean, he liked everybody in the world, except if you talked. <laughs> he will talk. <laughs> so... Um, and when the crash comes, it, it's difficult to contain it. It's like the window which sh shuts depression, where all interest in anything in the world goes out. In a mild form, such persons at the end of the day, throughout the day, from, from elation and hilarity and, and excitement, they slowly become tired and peevish and irritable, and then unhappy and depressed at the end of the day, or at the end of the week, to become depressed. And in extreme cases, real depression, medical depression happens. It's like the windows being shut and unable to open again. Is, he means it psychically, unable to reach out anymore. It's not that their eyes are closed, are glued shut and they can't open their eyes. They can, but the mind is not behind it anymore. There's no need, they, they have no more. Suddenly all interest in life goes out of them. They don't want to go out of their homes. They don't want to meet people. So he has a given a nice description of uh, depression. They are not interested in any activities, in jobs, even in entertainment. Nothing seems to interest them anymore. He says it's because of that extraordinary outpouring of pranic energy in the initial elation and excitement and the reaction is this depression. And he gives an example. Uh, this is 1950s. Uh, he says uh, there was a competition Greta Garbo look-alike competition and 500 contestants turned up. So we are seeing that I was thinking for weeks before that these ladies there must have been so much discussion and the costumes and the hairstyling and uh, who is doing a better job of looking like Greta Garbo. Uh, <laughs> she actually turned up in Hollywood. Swami Prabhavananda ji I think it was Greta Garbo. I, I, I'm, I'm, uh, Christopher Isherwood, he was very connected with the Hollywood film set. So he narrates how Greta Garbo, she was to come to the ashram there. And he said to Swami Prabhavanandaji there that, I like this place. And I'm sure she had a strong Italian accent. I'm not very sure, but uh, probably. I like this place. I want to stay here. And he said, you can't. This is for monks. She said, I can wear pants. <laughs> And then Ignat Ishwaran says, 500 lookalikes of Greta Garbo, so much excitement, I'm sure so much planning must have gone into it and then the actual contest. And then he says, I can clearly see in the city there will be 500 um, depressed people looking, at, looking like each other, <laughs> lookalikes. <laughs> it's the reaction of that. It, it's the come down from that. And this is very harmful for spiritual life. And this has been exacerbated in the age of uh, social media. 
I heard a talk by Jonathan Haidt who was talking about the sharp rise in mental illness among college students. Gen Z. Um, he says a 30% spike, 30% of college students are reporting some form of mental illness, especially depression. 30%! What an alarming figure. One third of our young people. What an alarming figure. Depression, a little digression here. I remember um, reading this book. I don't know if you have read it, but I strongly recommend not reading it. <laughs> it's guaranteed to throw you, it is guaranteed to traumatize you for life. It's called Sophie's Choice. Oh, oh you read it. Oh, no. So many people have read it. Uh, it's uh, William Styron. So I remember reading it. And do you remember, those of you who have read it, you remember Sophie's Choice? Sophie is this uh, Jewish lady in Second World War, uh, during the Second World War, who is captured by the... She's trying to flee from the Nazis. She's finally in the railway station. The crucial scene takes place in the railway station where she and her two little children, um, a girl, a little girl and an even younger boy. So she's trying to avoid the Nazis and get into train and escape. And the Nazi officer catches her. So it's very diabolic. It's very diabolical, this officer. Devilish, you know. He gives her a choice. He, his choice is so horrifying. He says, you can take one child with you. You choose which child. Telling a mother, that means the other child will be killed. And she chooses. She takes the little boy and leaves the girl on the platform, railway platform. And she, the description of that little girl and the expression on her face when she realizes her mother is walking away without her and his mother has chosen to take the brother away and leave her. To, and she doesn't know it's going, she's going to be killed. But anyway, she's going to be killed. And then eventually the story goes on and she loses the little boy also. And of course, she becomes almost insane afterwards. And that's, that's Sophie's choice. But what interested me was, who could write such a story? Who could write such a story? So I followed up. And William Styron has written another book. So William Styron, it, and it, it came out to, it's uh, true, it, it, it um, immediately matched. He was an acute depressive. He was a deeply depressed person. And he's written about it. And that's a remarkable book. It's called Memoirs of Madness. William Styron, Memoirs of Madness. Because he is an extraordinarily talented writer. And he had this depression. So he wrote about it very evocatively. Something that every depression patient feels. But he wrote about it very evocatively. Very, you know, he takes you through that kind of feeling. What it is that a, a patient of depression feels. And then there's a point to why I'm for, to point to this di digression. So then he, in that book he mentions that he tried to commit suicide. Luckily he was saved. And um, then he was put on medication. And this, this is the point. When he was put on medication later on, he says, I snapped out of it. And I can't, for the world of me now, I can't imagine why I wanted to kill myself. There's no, nothing so bad. So the mind in itself, Sri Krishna says in the Gita, it's your best friend and it's your worst enemy. The mind controlled, purified, directed towards you know, a high goal is your best friend. The mind uncontrolled, this elation and depression, this continuous, you know, if you follow it around, if you follow the mind around, if you listen to the mind, uh, it's diabolical. And um, I remember in the high Himalayas one day, I was sitting on the bank of the Ganga and a yogi who lived in the hut next to me told me this. I still haven't forgotten. It's so beautiful. He says the difference between a worldly mind and a yogic mind. He told me the difference. This was in August in the Himalayas. So there, it's just after the rains, so the, there's a lot of water in the Ganga, in the Gangotri there. And the water is muddy because uh, landslides and also muddy. He says, look at the Ganga now, that yogi told me. Look at the Ganga now. It is fast flowing, extremely dangerous. If anybody tries to cross, it will be swept away. 
there is a lot of water and the water is muddy you cannot drink it you cannot drink it similarly the worldly mind it's full of thoughts fast changing it is extremely dangerous it can ruin you and then uh, it is polluted like that water you cannot drink you can't drink or you cannot give anybody to drink he said similarly this mind is polluted it will not give you peace and it will not give peace to anybody else you will be a source of disturbance for everybody and a source of dis disturbance for yourself then he contrasted it with the yogi's mind he said uh, if you come here in winter into this place you will see uh, the same river there is very little water because most of it is frozen with very little water and uh, that means the thoughts are few and chosen Spec whatever thoughts the yogi wants only those thoughts are there then he said it's not dangerous you can walk across the river it's, it's shallow you can walk across the river um, similarly the yogi's mind is not dangerous it will take you to your goal it will not not harm you third uh, the water is pure he says it's so clean I still remember he says up upar se chavan ni gira do ab dek paoge pani ke niche you throw a, a quarter from the bridge there's a wooden bridge there if you throw it there you can read up the denomination of the coin uh, on the river bed it's, it's so pure the water so clear similarly the yogi's mind is very pure and he says you can drink the water you can give it to others to drink similarly the mind yogic mind will give you peace and will give peace to people around you so do not follow the mind around don't allow these extremes of elation and depression eknath ishwaran gives some solid advice for very um, practical advice remember it, those were the heydays of psychoanalysis and so he says depression immediate uh, three three things he recommends one is um, go out into a company of people you will at absolutely feel like not going out not mixing with anybody but go out stay in the company of people number one number two he said vigorous physical activity you will feel like not doing anything at all do just throw yourself into work and third he says behave normally internally you don't feel normal at all but externally behave normally talk normally go to work smile normally force yourself you don't feel like it at all internally until very soon you will so that's the interesting thing about faking it you know till me <laughs> faking it till you make it but it external behavior changes the mind also after some time so that is harsha marsha bhayo dvegai amarsha jealousy rumor mong mongering scandal mongering against other people in a inability to withstand the happiness of other people shridhar swami says i don't know which verse he says it um not here somewhere else he says he quotes an an older verse which says i'm a monks among the um, most uh, expert spreaders of rumors is a uh, monks monastic orders why because they don't have much work so <laughs> they sit around <laughs> gossiping they should not it's it's very harmful for spiritual life and so that the verse i've forgotten the original sanskrit but what it means is that uh, unfortunately there are those monks who are given to quarrel some ways who are lazy and uh, are given to gossip and rumor mongering such are cursed by the gods the road to spiritual enlightenment is open and you destroy it completely <laughs> by this kind of negative behavior so amarsha inability to withstand the happiness of others jealousy inability to inability to withstand others just i can't stand that person this is very bad because that person is the same divinity if you at all believe in vedanta it must be the same shiva in that form it if you it must be the same country it must be you in that form if you can't stand that person you can't stand yourself 
So, amarsha, no, never be like that and I can't withstand. There should be nobody whom you feel so strongly against. In the world, you should not be against anybody. Externally, how you behave will depend. You have to be skillful about dealing with different kinds of people, appropriately. And bhaiya, fear. Have no fear. Swami Vivekananda would again and again say, be fearless. Have no fear at all. Fear uh, kills before death. Those who, death kills you once, fear kills you every day, you know. Yasmano dujate loko, lokan na dujate chaya. Harsha marsha bhayo dvegai mukto yasa chame priya. Such a person who is free. How will you be free of all of these? Don't try. Don't try to drive away fear. Don't try to drive away depression, excitement. No, 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 no. Sri Ramakrishna's answer is the further you go towards God, the further the world will fall behind. He says the more you go walk towards the east, the more the west falls behind. So similarly, you walk towards, you know, they say, if you look, walk towards the sun, your shadow is behind you. So don't struggle with negativities. If we struggle with negativities like these, you feed strength into them. Don't struggle with these, don't even overanalyze. I've seen people, are, this is, they seem to be very sensitive, they seem to be very self-aware, but it's at a, at a narcissistic level. Endlessly talking about, I felt this and then I felt that. Nobody cares. <laughs> Nobody cares what you feel. And neither should you. It's the mind. It's the mind. The yogi understands the mind is like a little child. A sadhu to told this once, I still remember. Bacha rota hai, ma samajti hai. Aisa kuch khas nahi hua hai. I've forgotten the exact words. The child yells and cries and the mother understands nothing very serious. I remember uh, once I was sitting in an airport, screaming babies in the airport are the worst, especially in the planes. <laughs> I strongly recommend earplugs. So there was this little kid in front. Uh, was, see, the moment to moment change. He was so delighted he had a chocolate bar which he was uh, eating and the bar broke and fell or something like that. And he started screaming. The whole lounge resounded with his screams. Now, is it all that important just because one chocolate bar broke? No, of course not. Was it so delightful that one chocolate bar? No, of course not. But it's a great lesson to learn. Our minds behave in that way. Our minds behave in that way. Every little thing that goes our way, delight. But it's temporary. It will go away very soon. And every little thing that does not go our way, depression, this is called, psychologists call it catastrophizing. It's a catastrophe. It isn't a catastrophe. Nothing is a catastrophe. It's like the little child screaming its head off because one, it dropped one chocolate bar, a part of it. Now the parent knows, the mother or the father knows it's not very important. It's not at all very important. You must treat the mind like that. As far as the world is concerned and our reactions to the world and the reactions to people, the mind will go up and down like that. Treat it like, like it's no, no big deal. Even the best of things happening in this world, no big deal. Even the worst of things happening in this world, no big deal. Be concerned rather with the Lord. With your japa, with your meditation, with your Vedantic inquiry, with your service, uh, the uh, spiritual practice. The mind should be concerned with that. The more you go towards the world, or the more you go towards the Lord, the more the world stays behind, falls behind. The more you go towards Shiva, the more the Jagat or Samsara falls behind. Uh, any question? Observations, questions, comments? All right, yes. How are you supposed to? Oh wait, um, hold on to the question. He's got a microphone coming for you. Just raise your hand so he can bring it to you. Yeah. Tell us your name and ask the question. Hi, I'm Basil. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> how are you supposed to deal with uh, the uh, potential world disasters that are basically being pounded upon you in this, in this time? Yes, um, the serenity prayer I think is the best. The Lord give me the strength to change the things that I can change. 
to bear the things that I cannot change and the wisdom to know the <laughs> difference between the two. So often I have seen people getting very, very worked up about things which you have absolutely no freedom and nothing to do with it. And uh, it's far better to take action, to be useful, rather than to spend so much emotion in just feeling. A lot of people do that. They, they cry, they are angry, they shout, uh, they write, they immediately take to social media to uh, condemn this or that. But actually what are you doing on the ground? Nothing. But there is a sense of achievement. I've, I've said this. Nobody cares. I said it. Uh, it's much better to take action. Much better to be useful that way. Mm. Yeah. How about prayers? Prayer. That's a very good point. Where you cannot do anything for somebody or some cause or some place, it's good to pray for them. To actually start praying for them. To, uh, that helps. Well, in any case, it first helps us. And then maybe later on it helps those you are praying for. That's a good question. Yes. Um, Suresh from Kerala. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, in the world of we have to show compassion and uh, love to others around you, uh, how do you maintain equanimity, like you said, you know, uh, balance that high and low with yes. the ourselves? I have seen the best kind of love is the unsentimental kind of love. What goes for love in our society is sentimentality. Sometimes, even worse, sometimes it's virtue signaling. It's a new word, but I learned it's a nasty thing. It is, it's a childish way of showing I am better than you. Because I'm saying all the politically correct things. I'm expressing my opinion for all the uh, particular causes which are in style now. There's a term, radical chic. <laughs> so, what is in style now on campus in uh, society i'm i'm going i'm signing up for that and it's something that that's different every few days or every few weeks depending on the news cycle yeah, that's a worthless kind of life uh, it's deeply harmful to spiritual life this difference between actually doing something and and the uh, the emotionalism or sentimentalism the great uh, Vietnamese master Thich Nhat Hanh, who wrote that book, Miracle, Miracle of Mindfulness. So he says, when he first came to Europe, that was the time of Greenpeace protests against nuclear weapons um, in Europe. Now, anti-war protesters in Europe. So he said that the I found that these people who were protesting against war were so angry and they didn't see the contradiction in that. They said, of course, this is an um, important uh, issue. You must be indignant about it, angry about it. No, no, no. At no point is anger justified. Anger is somewhere I'm giving in to my own weaknesses somewhere. The greatest of reforms, actual activism is done when truly it is done for, uh, for a constructive purpose. Really you want a solution to it, then you can't afford to be angry. Whether it is Mahatma Gandhi or Nelson Mandela or Martin Luther King, they were not angry people. The British, there are people among whom, among the British, whom Mahatma Gandhi counted as his close friends. None of them ever felt that he, he hated them or he, not at all. Nobody ever felt that because he didn't. He didn't. So, yeah. Yes, there are a few hands there. We'll take those and then. Swami, my name is Arvind. Um, I. Um, Professionally, I, I work on um, research for a safety of AI. I struggle with this um, dilemma of how to raise awareness of the serious risk that it poses without... I need to, on some level, raise alarm, but I also don't want to 
want to don't want to destabilize other people like the verse says so how do i strike this balance i think any genuine activism um can also be spiritualized as withdrawal from um uh, contact with society can be is spiritual if you want to find god that also it's possible hermits monks always did that traditionally but also engagement with society and activism can be spiritualized that's the message of of karma yoga um, internally one must first have the attitude that i am doing it as a worship of you my lord or if you are not devotional by nature if you are not uh, you know if you're not a believing person in in god you don't have a faith in god in that sense then you're doing it just for the sake of that it's good to do good in that sense right um and it's good to be neutral what happens is when emotions are involved we we become which we we you know we take sides too strongly and we don't see the other side so that that applies to technology also there can be many things which technology can do for the world like ai it already is people are using it for so many things and the uh, problems which you see f- better than the rest of us because you are actually working in the field uh, it's quite amazing that someone like sam altman who i think who has uh, who founded this and released chat gpt but he has a, he has been quite um, what do you call it he has taken the initiative in trying to warn people write about it and speak to decision makers about the just today i got a call from there's an indian news agency called cnn 18 cnn 18 they called me they so they're having this huge uh, conference in india and they want me to speak there about what uh, as they said ai i said absolutely not i'm not an expert why are you calling me to speak about ai they said hear us out swami it's not about ai it's about the possible impact of ai on dharma good what could be good about it and what could be problematic about it can you give a short talk so they wanted me to fly to india i said absolutely not i'm not going to go to india now i <laughs> can if you i can arrange a online thing i can do it maybe a little bit but not much yeah more than this what can i say and this is a hot subject nowadays right now it is maybe the hottest subject and how seriously harmful it is you know better than others because you know the exact um, what state the technology is and what it might be in 6 months 5 years uh the gentleman behind you yes hi there i'm andrew as human beings we can experience so much and express so much all kinds of emotions all kinds of expressions and so when you're not following elation or depression what does your behavior look like and you don't look like a zombie if that's what you mean um uh, more more calm uh, you you can you can laugh uproariously if you want you can weep when there is a uh, sorrow and you just one good way is to look at the lives of the saints yeah so they don't look frozen they don't look like zombies Uh, they they react to the world and yet one thing that they never have is they are not they are not um, blown away from where they are centered they're centered in god that they never lose that footing that sure footing in the divine that they don't lose whether they are devotees whichever religion they belong to whether they are gyanis on the path of knowledge uh, which whatever they belong to they whichever path they are somewhere deeply anchored deeply centered within and that's amazing to see the bhagavad gita krishna himself says yasmin stito dukhena guruna api na vichalyate centered in which the heaviest of sorrows cannot shake you centered in which the heaviest of sorrows cannot shake you um, jesus also says if you build your house on firm foundations then the storms will come the wind will blow and the house will stand but if you build your house on sand the storm will come and the wind will blow the rains will lash it and the and the house will come tumbling down and he says great will be the fall 
um, that's what happens to us. That's why we had these crises in life, because we built a house on sand. Uh, when the shock comes, we can't take it. The shock is going to come to all of us. This is life. It will not stop just because I've attended a few lectures or sat for mindfulness meditation. No, but it will prepare me to ride out the shock much better. So what will life look like? Just like this. What will our reaction look like? Quite different. Quite different. Um, those who are going to do the, uh, the bhajan you can get ready. Yes. You had a question? Yes, you can ask the question. Well, they get ready, you can ask the question. Uh, thank you, Maharaj. Uh, I'm Lavanya. Uh, so, I have a que actually maybe two part question. Um, how do, how should we uh, get out of the grip of emotions? Suppose we are very much being carried away by something. If we are able to recognize that that's what is happening, how do we get out of it? I mean, it might be powerful enough that we are feeling one of those, whether it's uh, anger or fear or um, uh, jealousy or whatever. We are feeling that very intensely. Hmm. But how do we get out of it? There, there's uh, how All to right. ride so out the that's wave. Th that's the question. Yes. And, yes. And the second question is like, how do we distinguish between if we see a person with so-called who's indifferent to those? How do we distinguish between equanimity and avoidance? That they don't want to experience anything or don't even connect true, with it at true. all mm. versus they are actually equanimous. Yeah, don't bother. The second one, don't bother. <laughs> Let's just take care of ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th there are people who have this uh, avoidance uh, problem. Yes, you, those who want to, s you want to bring the basket out and just, yeah, just finish it now. Life itself will teach us. Fortunately or unfortunately, whether we use spirituality properly or we do not, life is there to let teach us hard lessons. You know, some people say spiritual bypassing. So you're using spiritual methods, not actually dealing with the problems in your life. And we are using, we are in the name of spirituality, we are bypassing the problems in our life, not confronting the problems in our life. Now what do you do? Don't do anything, even if you uh, spiritually bypassing, it won't work for long. And life is go going to give us kicks and blows, so... And if spiritual bypassing also won't work for long. But your first question, um, when you're in the grip of strong emotions, how do you overcome that? See, first and foremost, practically, it will overcome itself. No strong emotion lasts forever. Whether it's excitement or elation or unhappiness or jealousy or frustration, nothing lasts forever. The mind is ever changeful. But what you can do is, manage these patterns of behavior, especially negative patterns of behavior. One powerful way of overcoming these uh, negative emotions is bhakti. Is channelizing our emotions to God. More you connect it with the divine. So love, intense love, love of the divine. I feel frustrated. My frustration is because I cannot spiritualize my life. I cannot come close to God. That's my frustration, not with the world. The more we connect our positive and negative emotions with the world, everything turns into ashes. The more we connect our positive, even negative emotions with God, everything becomes nectar-like very soon. It, 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 is, it elevates us all the time. Somebody said, tears, said, uh, tears shed for Krishna uh, are more joyful than the, the greatest of worldly pleasures. If you cry for God, even that gives you such a sublime joy. Uh, the greatest of worldly pleasures cannot give you that joy. So connect it, uh, smiles and tears to God, not to the world. Uh, very soon it will transmute our, uh, uh, our emotions. Very good.